Volume One, Chapter Nine of That Unfortunate Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That Unfortunate Marriage by Francis Eleanor Trollope. Volume One, Chapter Nine. The correspondence between Mrs. Dobbs and Mrs. Dormersmith on the subject of May's removal to London was not voluminous. It consisted of three letters: number one, written by Mrs. Dobbs; number two, written by Mrs. Dormersmith; and number three, Mrs. Dobbs' reply to that mrs dobbs always went straight to the point both with tongue and pen and mrs dormersmith although by no means so forcibly direct in her dealings had a dislike to letter-writing which caused her to put her meaning tolerably clearly on this occasion so as to avoid the necessity of writing again mrs dobbs had proposed that may should become an inmate of her aunt's house in london at all events for a time in consideration of an annual sum to be paid for her board and dress the said sum was to be guaranteed by mrs dobbs and was so ample as to make pauline say plaintively to her husband just fancy frederick how deplorably imprudent augustus has been in offending and neglecting this old woman as he has done you see she has plenty of money i had no idea what her means were but it is clear that for a person in her rank of life she may be called rich and augustus might have obtained solid pecuniary assistance from her i've no doubt if he had played his cards with ordinary prudence but there never was any one so reckless of his own interests as augustus beginning with that unfortunate marriage whereunto mr frederick dormersmith thus made reply i don't know what you may call solid pecuniary assistance but it seems to me pretty solid to keep augustus's daughter and clothe her and pay for her schooling for four years and upwards as to augustus's disregard of his own interests it does not at any rate lie in the direction of refraining from borrowing money or remembering to pay it back that much i can vouch for pauline put a corner of her handkerchief to her eyes oh frederick she said it pains me to hear you speak so harshly remember augustus is my only brother mercifully by george if there was another of em i don't know what would become of us mrs dormersmith declined to consider this hypothesis but contented herself with saying that she should like to do something for poor augustus's girl and asking her husband if he didn't think they could manage to receive her mr dormersmith thought they could on the terms proposed which he frankly said were handsome and pauline added softly yes and it is satisfactory that she offers to keep the arrangement strictly secret it would scarcely do to let it be known that mrs dobbs pays for may it would be inconvenable people would ask all sorts of questions it would put the girl herself in an awkward position grandmother people would say what grandmother and the whole story of that wretched marriage would be raked up again but on the conditions proposed i do think frederick it could do no harm to receive may i am glad you consent it will be a comfort to me to feel that i am doing something for poor augustus's girl and acting as mamma would have wished so a favourable reply was dispatched to mrs dobbs application mrs dormersmith suggested that may should come to town a little before the beginning of the season so as to give time for preparing her wardrobe a task to which her aunt looked forward with dilettante relish and in answer to that mrs dobbs wrote the third and last letter of the series assenting to the date proposed for may's arrival and entering into a few minor details she had also meanwhile received a letter from captain cheffington elicited after a long delay by three successive urgent appeals for an immediate answer it was a scrawl in a hasty sprawling hand and ran thus brussels november one eighteen blank dear mrs dobbs i think it would be very desirable for miranda to be presented by her aunt if she is to be presented at all and to be brought out properly i have no doubt that my sister will introduce her in the best possible way since you seem to press for my consent you have it here with although i hardly feel that i can have much voice in the matter being separated as i have been for years from my country my family and my only surviving child i am a mere exile it is not a brilliant existence for a man born and brought up as i have been however i must make the best of it yours always a c this was sufficient for mrs dobbs she had made a point of obtaining augustus's authority for his daughter's removal to town not because she relied on his judgment but because she knew him well enough to fear some trick or sudden turn of feigned indignation if from any motive of his own he thought fit to disapprove the step as to the tone of his reply that neither troubled nor surprised her but mr weatherhead was moved to great wrath by it mrs dobbs had tossed the note to him one day saying there there's my son-in-law's consent to may's going to town in black and white that's a document mr weatherhead eagerly pounced on it 
"'What a disgusting production!' he exclaimed, looking up over the rim of the double eyeglasses, which he had set astride his nose to read the note. "'Is it?' returned Mrs. Dobbs carelessly. "'Is it? Why, Sarah, you surprise me, taking it in that cool way. It is the most thankless, unfeeling, selfish production I ever read in my life.' "'Oh, is that all? Well, but that's just Augustus Cheffington. We know what he is at this time of the day, Joe Weatherhead.' "'It'd be a deal stranger if he wrote thankfully and feelingly and unselfishly.' But Mr. Weatherhead refused to dismiss the matter thus easily. He belonged to that numerous category of persons, who, having established and proclaimed a conviction, appear to be immensely astonished at each confirmation of it. He had years ago pronounced Augustus Cheffington to be a heartless scoundrel. Nevertheless, he was shocked and amazed whenever Augustus Cheffington did anything to corroborate that opinion. The letter from Mrs. Dormer Smith was not shown to him— Mrs. Dobbs meant to keep the amount she was to pay for May a secret even from her faithful and trusted friend Joe. He might guess what he pleased, but she would not tell him. The means, too, by which she meant to raise the money would not, she knew, meet with his approval, and since she had resolved to use those means, she thought it best to avoid vain discussion beforehand, and therefore said nothing about them. Accident, however, revealed a part of the secret in this way. Mr. Weatherhead calling one afternoon at laurel villa to see mrs simpson who had been kept at home by a cold found other visitors there miss polly and miss patty piper were drinking tea out of mrs simpson's best cups and saucers and chatting away with their usual cheerfulness and volubility the miss pipers as they would themselves have expressed it moved in a superior sphere to that of the music teacher and his wife but they did not consider that they derogated from their gentility by occasionally drinking tea and having a chat with the simpsons they liked to condescend a little and opportunities for condescension were rather rare. Then, too, they had a certain interest in Sebastian Bach Simpson, inherited from the long-ago days when Sebastian Bach's father played the organ in their father's church. And Miss Polly and Miss Patty wore white frocks and blue sashes at evening parties, and were the objects of a good deal of attention from the Reverend Reuben's curates. Besides the sisters, there was present Dr. Hatch, who had come to pay a professional visit to Mrs. Simpson, and who was just going away it was a peculiarity of dr hatch to be always just going away he had a very large practice and was wont to aver that his professional duties scarcely left him time to eat or sleep yet dr hatch's horses stood waiting through many a quarter of an hour during which their master was engaged in conversation not of a strictly professional nature when mr weatherhead entered the best parlour of laurel villa dr hatch had a cup of tea in one hand and his watch in the other and greeted the new arrival with a friendly nod and the assurance that he was just off mrs simpson shook hands with mr weatherhead and the miss pipers graciously bowed to him he too was connected in their minds with old times miss polly specially remembered seeing him on her visits to the birmingham musical festivals when her father would take the opportunity of turning over weatherhead's stock of books and making a few purchases and once the Pipers had lodged during a festival week in the rooms over Weatherhead's shop. "'Glad to see you better, Mrs. Simpson,' said Joe, taking a seat after having saluted the company. "'Oh, yes, thank you. I'm quite well now. I know Dr. Hatch will scold me if he hears me say so,' with an arch glance, balked of its effect by the unsympathetic spectacles, "'because he tells me I still need great care, but my cough is gone. It is, really.' Mrs. Simpson girlishly shook back her curls and proceeded to pour out a cup of tea for Mr. Weatherhead." "'And how is Simpson?' asked the latter. "'Bassie is very well, only immensely busy. "'He has three new pupils for pianoforte and harmony. "'The daughters of Colonel... Uh, "'Tut, I forgot his name, recommended by that kind Major Mitten, "'or at least it would be more proper to say "'that Major Mitten recommended Bassie to them. "'Not very polite to say that the young ladies were recommended. "'Oh, dear, I beg pardon. "'I'm afraid I've oversweetened your tea.' "'She had, in fact, put in half a dozen lumps one after the other. "'But Mr. Weather had fished a great part of them out again with his teaspoon.' and deposited them in the saucer, saying it was of no consequence. "'I'm so sadly absent-minded,' said Mrs. Simpson, smiling sweetly. "'Bazzy would scold me if he were here.' "'Serve you right if he did,' said Dr. Hatch, rising from the table. "'You should pay attention to what you're doing. I expect to hear that you have swallowed the embrocation and anointed your throat with syrup of squills.' "'Oh, doctor, you say the drollest things!' exclaimed the amiable Amelia, with an enjoying giggle. "'Oh, no, not the drollest, thank heaven.' i hear a great many droller things than i say that's what mainly supports me in my day's practice mrs simpson not in the least understanding him giggled again dr hatch had the reputation of being a wag and amelia simpson was not the woman to defraud him of a laugh on any such selfish ground as not seeing the point of his joke well mr weatherhead said miss patty piper blandly so we are to have your sister-in-law for a neighbour i hear joe poked his nose forward and pursed up his mouth 
oh ho my sister-in-law mrs dobbs how do you mean ma'am as a neighbour we understand that mrs dobbs has been looking after jessamine cottage the little white house with a garden on the gloucester road returned miss patty dr hatch paused with his hand on the latch of the parlour door to hear oh dear no said joe weatherhead decisively quite a mistake sarah dobbs is too wedded to her old home nothing would induce her to leave friars row you must have been misinformed ma'am as to leaving friars row put in miss polly she must do that in any case for she has let the premises as offices and at a high rent too i hear friars row is considered a choice position for business purposes joe had opened his mouth to protest once more when a sudden idea made him shut it again without speaking oh he gasped and then made a little pause before proceeding ah uh, well she it wasn't quite settled when i heard last would you mind stating your authority ma'am the best mr bragg told us himself his managing man at the works has made the arrangement mr bragg has been looking out for a more central office for some time i told mrs dobbs long ago that she was living at an extravagant rental by sticking to friars row observed dr hatch turning the handle of the door depend on it she has let it at a swinging rent and quite right too now i really am off joe weatherhead sat very still after the doctor's departure with his cup of tea in his hand and a pondering expression of face the miss pipers were not sufficiently interested in him to observe his demeanour very closely if they did chance to notice that he was unusually silent that was accounted for by his sense of the superior company he found himself in they always spoke of him as a good odd creature with sound principles a very respectable man who knew his station as for amelia simpson she was habitually unobservant with an inconvenient faculty however of suddenly making clear-sighted remarks when they were least expected i am sure this is very good news for us she exclaimed jessamine cottage is so near at least it was quite close to us when we lived in marble terrace it will be a good move for mrs dobbs the air in our neighbourhood is so much better than in her part of town said miss patty with a certain complacency as who should say the merit of this atmospheric superiority is all our own but we are not proud and yet i am surprised too at mrs dobbs moving replied amelia she always declared that she hated the suburbs with their little slight-built houses that cannot apply to our house said miss polly garnet lodge stood in its own ground many a long year before those new houses sprung up between greenhill road and the gloucester road but mrs dobbs isn't going to live in garnet lodge returned amelia with one of her sudden illuminations of common sense and jessamine cottage is a mere bandbox i remember mrs dobbs among the trebles in esther observed miss polly she had a fine clear voice and could take the b flat and alt with perfect ease and her husband sold capital ironmongery we have a coal scuttle in the kitchen now which was bought at his shop a thoroughly solid article added miss patty these appreciative words about the Dobbses, which at other times would have gratified Joe Weatherhead, now fell on an unheeding ear. He took his leave very shortly and walked straight to Friars Row. "'Well, Sarah Dobbs,' said he on entering the parlour, "'I didn't think you would steal a march on me like this. I did believe you'd have trusted me sooner than a parcel of strangers after all these years.' He did not sit down in his usual place by the fireside, but remained standing opposite to his old friend, looking at her with a troubled countenance mrs dobbs gave him one quick keen glance and then said so you've heard it joe well i didn't mean that you should hear it from any one but me but who shall stop chattering tongues they rage like a fire in the stubble and the poorer and lighter the fuel the bigger blaze it makes it was settled only this very morning too it is true then sarah i had a kind of hankering hope that it might only be trash and chit-chat you mean about my letting my house don't you yes that's true and me never to know a word of it to hear it from strangers now look here joe let us talk sensibly sit down can't you but joe would not sit down and after a minute's pause mrs dobbs went on i'll tell you the truth i didn't say a word to you of my plan beforehand because i was afraid to there afraid you sarah dobbs afraid of me that's a good one but his face relaxed a little from its pained fixed look yes afraid of what you'd say i knew you wouldn't approve and i knew why you wouldn't approve for my sake but thinks i when once it's done joe may scold a little but he'll forgive his old friend and i never thought of chattering jack dawes calling the matter from the housetops i meant to tell you myself this very afternoon i did indeed joe joe drew a little nearer to his accustomed chair and put his hand on the back of it keeping his face turned away from mrs dobbs 
of course you're the mistress to do what you like with your own property he muttered nobody's mistress or master either to do what's wrong with their own property i mean to do what's right if i can i was never one to heed much what outside folk think of me but i do heed what you think joe and reason good and i want you to know my feeling about the matter once for all and then we can leave it alone mr weatherhead here slid quietly into the armchair and sat with his face still turned towards the fire you know continued mrs dobbs i told you some weeks ago that i was troubled about the child's position here she is a real lady and ought to be acknowledged as such that's the only good that can come now from poor susie's marriage and i do hold to it there was only one way that i could see of managing what i wanted i could do it at a sacrifice after all a very small sacrifice joe weatherhead shook his head emphatically yes really and truly a very small sacrifice persisted mrs dobbs i don't see why i shouldn't be just as happy and comfortable in jessamine cottage as here provided of course that my old friends don't cut me and sulk with me i shall be lonely enough when once the child's gone and you and me'll have to cheer each other up and keep each other company as well as we can you won't refuse to do that will you joe um shake hands on it joe slowly put out his hand and grasped her proffered one he then took out filled and lighted his meerschaum and smoked in silence for some quarter of an hour mrs dobbs meanwhile knitting in equal silence all at once she said hark there's may's step coming downstairs now you'll please to understand that when my moving from this house is mentioned to the child it's because i find friar's row too noisy and think the air in greenhill road will agree better with my health i trust you for that joe weatherhead mind may at this moment came gaily into the room and mr weatherhead thus solemnly addressed her miranda cheffington you have been to a first-rate school and have read your roman history and all that haven't you not much i'm afraid uncle joe you have read about lucretia and portia and the mother of the gracchi pronounced gracchi for joe's instructions had been chiefly taken in by the eye rather than the ear in the shape of miscellaneous gleanings from his own stock in trade and other distinguished women of classical times whose virtues were in my opinion not wholly unconnected with bounce may laughed and nodded well allow me to tell you that there are english women at the present day whom i consider far superior in all that makes a real good woman to any roman or grecian of them all english women to whom bounce in every form is foreign and obnoxious english women who do good by stealth and never blush to find it fame because fame is a great deal too busy with rascals and hussies ever to trouble herself about them your grandmother mrs sarah dobbs whom i'm proud to call my friend is one of those women and what's more and i'll have you bear it in mind miranda cheffington i believe you'd be puzzled to find her equal in europe asia africa or america not to mention australasia and the whole of the islands in the pacific ocean with that mr weatherhead walked gravely out his nose somewhat redder than usual, and his eyes glistening. End of chapter 9